Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to welcome acclaimed portraitist Lydia Panis as tonight's guest speaker. Lydia earned a BA in Psychology from Boston College as well as a BFA from the School of Visual Arts here in New York City and she went on to complete her MFA degree in photography from NYU. She is represented by Schneider Gallery in Chicago and Gordon Potts Gallery in San Francisco. Lydia's work is in the permanent collections of the Br Brooklyn Museum, Museum of Fine Arts Houston, Allentown Arts Museum, Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, Museum of Photographic Arts San Diego, and MoMA Zendai Shanghai, among others. She is a recipient of a Whitney Museum Independent Study Fellowship, the Taylor Wessling Portrait Prize, a grantee of the Pennsylvania Partners in the Arts, and a Center for Emerging Visual Arts Fellow. Recent publications include the New York Times Magazine, Photo District News, and Popular Photography. Her first monograph, The Mark of Abel, published by Kara Ferlock, was named a Photo District News Book of 2012, as well as Best Coffee Table Book by the Daily Beast. So please help me giving Lydia a warm welcome to our lecture series. Um, thank you, Katrine. Should I be speaking into this thing? Is it too loud? No. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I, I want to thank Katrine and Jaime for inviting me. I'm, I'm really honored to be here, um, especially since um, I'm an alumni of SVA. It's, um, I am really super excited to be here, a little nervous, but super excited. Um, so what I'm gonna do today is go through um, a little bit of a history, basically like a chronological history of my work since about 1995. Um, and I'm gonna start by reading a short intro and then I'll get into it. So, um, um, since about 2005, my work has focused on relationships and the notion of closeness. My various projects photographing families, uh, friendships, and individuals often gravitate to matters of intimacy, trust, and vulnerability, subjects that I think most of us grapple with at one time or another. I don't set out knowing where my work will go when I begin a series. Instead, the topics find me. They unfold slowly and reveal themselves in bits and pieces, showing me in the process what matters most. I think that we all become artists out of a need to express how we see the world. I was a shy and reserved child, but I longed to be heard and understood. I think that we all do. It is said, that making art is being caught between the desire to express yourself and the fear of being exposed. These two opposing feelings are very present in all of my work. In part, this comes from having moved around a lot at a very young age. I was born in the States um, where my Greek parents were living temporarily to finish their medical degrees. By the time I was two, we had moved back to Greece and by the time I was five, we had moved back to the States again. I found myself in kindergarten, midway through the year, without the English language to communicate. The differences in culture and language and the swiftness and timing of the moves instilled in me a sense that I had to watch people closely. I became very good at reading people so I could fit in. I also read voraciously. It helped me feel less lonely and offered a window into other people's lives. Language was important, but I had difficulty putting my thoughts into words. So after getting an undergraduate degree in Boston in psychology and literature, I went back to art school, to SVA, and it was here that I discovered that through photography, I could directly communicate the kinds of things I wanted to say. For about 20 years, I worked in black and white. I made different kinds of work, most of it of a conceptual nature, and portraits were always at the top of the list. So um, this is where I'm going to kind of move into the talk. Uh, this is a, a piece from 1995. Um, it says from a, a series I call the Italian series. I spent the summer of 95 in Italy with my sister. Um, 
I was pregnant with my third child, and my father had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. So uh, it was, and it was also a super, super hot summer. And so I made this series of portraits of my children that I think on some level are, are kind of a combination of like stillness and, and heat and quietness. There was a sense I think I had of hope about this third child, about this life that was inside of me. And also um, just, you know, great despair at the thought of losing my father. So this one is called Anna with Pine Cones. Um, and this one is Still Life with Pears. My father died uh, at Christmas of 1995. In 96, we took the family um, to Greece, and I did a series called My Father's Lands Revisited, uh, basically tracing the footsteps and the stones that my father had walked through. And so this one is called The Stone Necklace, and it's, it was taken, it's, it's my niece, and it was taken on the uh, beach where my father learned how to swim and where he taught me how to swim. Uh, this is from 97. Um, these are just excerpts from series that I made. This is a series I call Brazil series. I spent some time in Brazil with a friend of mine. The family did. This one's called Icarus, about the boy who flew too close to the sun. And Voodoo. Mm -hmm. So about 1999, I'm skipping a little bit, 1999, um, I changed from medium format to large format film to a to four by five camera. And my children at this point were totally not interested in being photographed anymore. So what happened was I was using them wherever I could. I was like using their limbs if they let me, you know, their arms and their legs. Um, uh, this is another one from right around that period. I was also making work with very, very little time on my hands. I had three kids, I was teaching, I was running this, I was living on this farm, I had all kinds of it was, you know, it was really, I had very little time to make work. So I started to devise projects that I could make when the kids were napping, you know, just with, just sort of on the sly. And uh, I did a series of still lives. One of them was a series of still lives. I collected three things that were kind of personal to me for, th for two years, from 2000 to 2002. So I collected baker's chocolate, and I collected hair that fell out of my head when I blow dried, and I collected lint from our clothes dryer. Um, the chocolates I called portions. Basically, I would go to the grocery store and I would pick up a portion of chocolate. So this might be like two portions. This one, they had names, I don't remember exactly, but this is maybe nine portions. Maybe 30 portions. <laughs> this was however many portions it was at the end of two years. I also collected hairs that fell from my head when I blew dry or blow dried. Um, and because they were blow dries, I called them blows. Um, so this one is three blows. What I did was every, I, every time I blow dry my hair, like hairs would fall on the floor, I would collect them, I would turn, you know, like roll them up into little balls and put them in a box and save them. I was also very picky about the hairs, they had to be mine. Um, like people were offering me hair like all over the place. I was like, oh no, thank you. This is very personal. Um, I also didn't use hair from like vacations or on trips. It was only had to be hair that happened when I blow dried in my house. So uh, this is, I don't know, maybe 29 blows. I'm not exactly sure how many. I don't remember the numbers, but it kept accumulating. And this, after two years of collecting hair, I ended up with this. And then I also collected lint for my clothes dryer. I called them uh, cycles, for dryer cycles. And they all had numbers on them, maybe 17 cycles. Um, I'm kind of making up the numbers, but um, maybe 48 cycles. Um, I was photographing these on the floor with my four by five turned down towards the floor. So what was happening with the lint, it was, it was like, like coming up, getting closer and closer to my camera. And this was the final number of lint cycles after two years. Um, what was interesting to me about it is that it was a very, it was a conceptual rendering of a very personal space. And um, since the kids didn't want to pose for me anymore, I was still like shooting them in a way because this was like the, the lint from their clothing. So I love that about it. Oh, this is an install shot. Um, this is the way one curator hung it mm -hmm. on this huge wall. It was, it was really quite nice. 
Um, so after working for about 20 years in black and white, what, one of the things I found was I was always like months and months behind in the darkroom and I thought I can't deal with this anymore. If I go to color, maybe like things will be faster, color is easier, right? Um, and so in 2005, I decided to try color. This was in fact the first photograph I made. It was a test. Um, my kids, some of the, two of the kids are mine, two are my niece and nephew and a friend. I basically just got my four by five camera out and I asked them to stand and just come out of the pool for a few minutes, just come out and stand in front of me. I just wanna see you know, what happens. And um, as they stood there, I, I, I picked a spot and I said, will you guys just stand in front of me? Um, and each of them, what was really interesting about it is how each of them took a certain position in front of the camera, like my niece in the very front. This, this is my little Italian niece, was kind of very much going to be in the front and center. My daughter in the back, she was like, yeah, right. So she pulled back. Each kid kind of had a little different personality. Um, and it was kind of interesting. I mean, I found it sort of, it was kind of fun. But more than that, when I got the, the film back, I was really, really surprised at um, to see like, all the tension that was going on like it were, there were all these there were five different personalities and even though they were a group and they were together and they shared a strong history each of them was a little bit in their own world like each one had their own very different thing going on like there's it seemed to me like there was a lot of stuff going on um, so I called this one Tatiana for my niece um, and this was the beginning of my work on relationships. It happened innocuously. I really didn't know what I was doing. I just had a good time doing this. So I began to invite other people to my farm. All the work is made on my farm in Pennsylvania, in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. And so I, the people that are in these pictures are all people I know in one way or another. They're either, most of them are students, like the young lady in the pink, um, or friends or friends' kids, or just people I know at least in one way or another. So like this particular woman, this young lady, Asha, would always like talk about her little sister. She had been a Polish immigrant and she would always talk about how much she like cared about her sister. And I said, you know, Asha, why don't you bring your little sister to me one day? And what I noticed was how much the little sister really looked up to her, her older sister. And that's kind of what I caught. Um, this one is a family, a father and his four kids. Um, you know, I, when I go into a shoot, I really don't have any preconceptions. I kind of just show up and, and, and sort of see what happens. But I had a little bit of a, a, a preconception in this one. I just assumed that the young lady would take the front position or the star position. I figured she's got three brothers. She's, you know, the second youngest child. She's going to clearly be the star. But instead, the boy in the black t-shirt kind of went front and center. Um, and one of, for me, one of the most notable things about this, which I actually didn't notice, I think, till afterwards, was how he held his fist so tight. Like there was all this intensity in his fist, almost as if having this star position in the family somehow entailed a certain kind of anxiety. And if you compare that, for instance, to the, art, to the little hand, the slack hand of his sister, it's so different. Um, this is another family, a father and mother and their two daughters. And this one I called French pastoral. They're two friends, they're, they're French, which is why I called it that. Um, they were very good friends and, and, and friends of mine. The interesting thing about them is they came separately, but when they showed up, they were both wearing sort of a similar outfit, the, the black and the V-neck. And they both, what I noticed immediately was they both had these very long, beautiful fingers. Um, so when they were first posing for me, because I had the camera turn horizontally like this, I couldn't see the bottoms of their hands, just like over here with this one. So I asked them to pull their hands up. I just said, would you guys mind pulling your hands up? Because I don't give a lot of, of, of direction, but I did in this case. I said, would you mind just pulling your hands up? Which is how they did that, how we came up with the position of the hands on their stomachs. For me, this image is a reference to friendship and also to motherhood and its hopes and fears. Um, it, it reminded me so much of being pregnant and how when you're pregnant, like, you know, your, 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 your thoughts are that you're going to have this perfect child. Um, and, and of course, you know, nobody's perfect. <laughs> well, you know, there are disappointments too. <laughs> I mean, my daughter's perfect, but besides that. <laughs> um, 
two best friends who I, you know, looked so similar. They were outside playing, and I was like, oh my gosh, I've got to photograph you guys. Um, they were, they looked so similar, but um, as, as soon as I got the camera out, what I noticed that the, the two faces had these two very different expressions on their faces. One of them seemed so open, and the other one seemed so shut off somehow. I called this one the coat. Um, be, these were two students of mine who were very good friends, and um, the young man on the on this side. Um, he used to photograph that coat in class a fair amount, and so he he offered to bring it, and I was like, yeah, sure. But he was wearing a shirt underneath, and the shirt kind of wasn't working. It was also like ten below that day. So, mm. But he and I said to him, you know, would you be okay with like taking the shirt off? And he was really gracious, and he took it off. Um, so I ended up calling it the coat. And you know, for me, it's a little bit of a reference, you know, about lifestyle and sexual preference. You know. Invincible, I call this. These are four sisters. So this is the series that, um, I worked on this series from 2005 to 2008. Um, and this was the series that, um, that I made my monograph, my first monograph is of, and it's called The Mark of Abel, um, which for me really references complicated family relationships. I mean, Abel was the brother of, of Cain and Abel, and I, I, I always get the brothers mixed up, but I think Abel was the one who killed Cain. Is no, that the way it worked? The opposite. Okay, so. Cain killed Abel. Cain killed Abel, and this is the mark of Abel. Right, right. So Abel is the one who was the preferred brother, or who, who brought the, perfect, the better gift. And he was the one who was then killed for whatever. So I, there was a quote by Diane Arbus at the Met, like a number of years ago, there was that show, and she had a quote about the Mark of Abel, and she said, the higher you go in terms of like, you know, she was photographing winners, and she was talking about competitions, and in the quote it said something along the lines of, um, the higher you go, the greater the risk of, of falling, mm -hmm. you know, of, 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 fail, of failure, um, which I thought was really kind of an interesting quote. Um, I, I, for me, it also referenced the notion of complicated family relationships, which is, ultimately what I ended up calling this and what the project ultimately became about. Um, this is a, a niece and, a, and, a, and an aunt, but they're very much like mother-daughter. They're very, very close. Um, and for me, what was interesting about this image was how um, the younger one put this calming hand on the shoulder of the, of the older one, as if the younger one was comforting the older person, which, you know, it's usually the other way around. Uh, this one I'm including because when I was young, this is me and my sister when we were little, and when we were young, my mother used to dress us in these pretty dresses. They were always matched, and she would take pictures of us. She'd be like, okay, now we're going to take pictures, and um, we always looked awkward and goofy and kind of a little bit like we kind of wanted to protest, but we didn't dare say no. Yes. So. This photograph reminds me so much of the photograph of me and my sisters, except that these two young ladies are so much more savvy. And they're kind of like not so sure they're buying the way they're being represented. <laughs> oh, this one is about um, early love, first love, um, and how, you know, usually this usually doesn't work out. And I just had this sense about these two. It wasn't going <laughs> to happen. <laughs> I learned to read people very early on. <laughs> uh, this one is called Portrait of a Young Man. Um, this is a father and son. Um, and for me, this image is very much about the inevitable distancing that has to happen between a father, uh, between parents and their adult children. And in fact, and this is really pretty unconscious, but what I noticed is all my photographs of, of, of parents with adult children are always about that separation. You know, about that, like that necessary sort of separation. So this is, you know, a mother and, and her daughter. And, and, and for me, what was interesting was how strong the mother was and how charismatic and how, how, how confident. Um, and how the daughter n next to the mom seems like she's wearing sort of that tight kind of tube top and her, her arms are kind of held down almost like she seems a little bit restrained. But at the same time, I felt like I could see in her eyes that she was going to become, you know, she was going to grow into being this very strong and, and sort of, you know, charismatic woman too. It just was a matter of some time. Uh, this also, this is a mother and a son and a grandchild. Mm -hmm. 
this was the one person in the entire series I didn't really know. She had, um, they had bought a piano from us. I put an ad in a paper and, and, and we were selling our piano and she had come to buy it and I was like, wow, boy, I would really like to photograph you. So she came back you know, with her whole family. She had a husband and, a, and an infant. Um, but, but this is the image I ultimately kept. For me, it was very much about a mother and her first child as the other ones come along. This one is called Family. Um, this one was kind of interesting. They got lost coming out. I live way out in the country and they got lost and by the time they showed up, they were like 45 minutes late, and by the time we, they showed up, I had like 15 minutes to shoot before the sun was going down. So I over, you know, I was kind of overexposing just to make sure I got something and luckily I did. Um, this was a family that had been sort of separated, I guess, early on and then sort of reunited later. Um, and for me, it was really so much about the beauty and, and despite all this beauty, there was also sort of a certain kind of sadness, I thought. Um, a couple who was engaged to be married. And this one I call Amy Lubzanski and her sister. Um, they're two sisters. The one on the left, yeah, on the left was um, a student of mine and she used to photograph her sister in class. Um, for me, this image is about what we are willing to look at and what we close our eyes to. So um, 2005 to 2008, I, three years I worked on this. And then I thought, it started to get like, you know what, I can do this pretty easily. I, I need to do something different. And so to challenge myself, I decided to come up with different parameters. Um, so I decided to change cameras. I went from a large format camera horizontal, you know, like a horizontal format, to a medium format square from outside to inside, so the lighting challenge was very different, and from photographing groups to photographing individuals. Um, <coughs> it was very kind of, it happened sort of on the spur of the moment. It was that my nephew and niece were visiting again from Italy, and we were sitting at dinner one night, um, and my nephew was wearing this little <laughs> green t-shirt, and I had this melon sitting on the picnic table outside, and I was gonna cut it up for dinner, for, for dessert. Only it was sitting next to him, and I thought, oh my gosh, Marchie, you look so good with this melon. Like, we're not eating this. We're gonna, I'm going <laughs> to photograph you tomorrow. So I took him into the studio. You know, he was kicking and screaming. He didn't want to come in. But, <laughs> but um, I, I made this image. Um, one of the things I immediately noticed from going from outside, well, going from groups to individuals, is how much more intense the relationship was for me. Photographing one person versus photographing a group. The other thing about this series is that it is very much inspired by um, early Dutch and Italian painting, which is kind of like the place I go. Like when I go into a museum, that's where I gravitate to first. I'm really interested. It, it, it really interests me, like the plain black backgrounds, like the fact that there are no distractions, the kind of universal, timeless aspect of that work, and how. Um, like you can look at work from centuries ago and it still feels so contemporary. It's still so much about the emotions of the sitter and it's, 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 you don't have to like make leaps into like what they're wearing and what they're doing. It's really so much about how they connect psychologically and that doesn't change obviously through the ages. Th that to me is, is, is really fascinating. Um, so I, so I photographed my nephew and I thought, wow, this is interesting. And I realized basically that by adding a piece of food, I was adding kind of a different kind of tension to the image. Uh, yeah, an old painting, just a reference to the old work. Um, I worked on this for two years. The first year, the entire first year I worked on this, um, I. I would photograph and I think, oh my God, I'm like seriously wasting my time and film and money and all kinds of things. But I was drawn to it. I kept doing it. I just kept inviting people. I would have a, like a kind of an array of food there because I didn't know what they would wear and I sort of had to, um, you know, match the food to the outfit. Um, I got really good at it after two years. I was, I, I kind of had this sense about what someone should be holding, you know, before they even came. For about a year, I didn't know what I was doing, and it wasn't until about a year afterwards I printed that I made like eight by ten prints, and I like, put them out on my studio floor. And as I looked at them all together, I realized like what was going on. 
Um, I've, I've, I've shown these a number of times, but never in the way I really want to, which is in kind of a round room, sort of a round sort of space, almost as if you're entering a banquet, because it's kind of like a feast. It, it's like there are all these participants who are bringing their bounty or their nourishment to the table. Only, I think what happens is that it's not clear if they're actually offering it or withholding. There's this weird push and pull, um, which again is one of, whoops, which again is one of those things that um, I realized very much later that I was photographing. Uh, this is an image I, I, ju I just wanted to mention. This one is um, the combination of portraiture and still life and the, the notion of bringing food into the pictures. Um, this is when I was a kid. I used to go to museums and these paintings used to fascinate me. It, it was always like they referenced a kind of reality. They referenced like where food comes from and they referenced the sense that there's kind of like the kind of messy thing, th that there are like messy things going on underneath. It's not, it, beneath the surface, it's, it's messier than, than like, you know, your packaged Twinkies. Um, and that's another one of these things that interests me so much, the, the notion of what's going on beneath the surface. That's like my fascination. I always want to know this. Um, so this young lady is holding figs. In some of the images, I think the, the model looks kind of vulnerable. In other ones, there's, is, I think, almost maybe the viewer feels a little bit more vulnerable in, in the face of the, of, the, of the image. So it seems like they go back and forth. Uh, this is called Pink Cake. <laughs> Fish. So what I'm photographing, I think, now in retrospect, is that push-pull of emotions. That place where you know you're not quite sure whether you're being received. Some of them are softer, some of them are harder. Some of them are easier, more difficult. I think in a lot of my work, There's this sense of like a push-pull, you know, of connections. <coughs> that place in between where you're not quite sure. You know, the messy place in between in, 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 in relationships. So I just put together a book. I, I'm, I'm putting out a second book now. Um, this is a self-published one that I'm calling Falling from Grace, which, which is actually the, the title of this series. Um, so the next slide then is from another series I did. I started in 2011. Um, I, I started to realize that my work was very much about love, intimacy, vulnerability. And uh, I titled this Something Like Love. I, I think I got the name, some blogger wrote about my work and kind of talked about it as something like love. And I thought, yeah, you know, he's right. Like it, it really is about something like love. Um, so this one is called Summer, because that's their last name, the mother and daughter. Um, I was going back outside again, with, again, changing the format of the, fi of the camera, changing the parameters. That's, the, that's my niece and nephew, that's Tatiana from the, the cover girl with the bra. It's the same girl a few years later. Mm -hmm. uh, this is um, Two Sisters. While I was doing this, I was also asking my models three questions. Mm -hmm. I asked them, um, what do you long for? What do you regret? And what are you afraid of? Um, I would ask them after the shoot, after they would go home, I, I would write them a thank you note, you know, in an email, and I would say, you know, if you're willing, um, you know, would you answer these three questions? Um, and I got the most beautifully poignant answers. Uh, it, was, it was really stunning. I think if I ever put a book together, I, I'm going to include some of them anonymously um, because they're, they're so personal. Um, this is a father and daughter. Okay, and this, this is moving into my next series. 
I had been reading at the time this book about this painting. There's a book, maybe you've read it, I think artists like this book. It's, it's, a, it's an entire book about this painting, which is a John Singer Sargent painting called uh, The Daughters of Edward Darley Bois. I, I mean, it speaks to the strength of this painting that someone could write an entire book um, about these girls, about their mother, about the family. I mean, it was fascinating. They, um, they were like these sort of Boston socialites. Um, and uh, what was, uh, so what I did is I went up to Boston to see the painting. I was stunned by it. I mean, it's, it's actually, the actual painting is, I think, bigger than what you're looking at here. Uh, and if you've never seen it in person, it's, it's really stunning. It's also in the middle of a room of all these sar sergeant paintings. Um, and and what, what really s strikes me very much about this painting is, um, is the space and how kind of lonely the image feels. Um, and how these girls, there's a kind of like unsettled quality about these girls. They're, they're, they're painted in a foyer, which is unusual for that time period for girls of such wealth and privilege. In the room in, in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, to the side of this painting is their mother. And you know, she's grand. You know, she's sitting in this chair and she's, you know, wonderful. Uh, and it's such a contrast. And it was amazing to me to see how Sargent like literally picked up on this at, at this age. And in the book, um, it you know it goes through their history, and and you know it, it it's 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 a little. Well, they didn't become like their mother. Very very different. So I happened to, at this time same time also starting a new series, and I called it After Sergeant, um, not because my photographs look like sergeants at all, but because I am so interested in the psychology and and watching people and how they interact together, and it, it is something that fascinates me. So um, these are outside, these images, even though they look like they're inside, they're all taken outside. So these are two uh, very best friends. Uh, these are two twin sisters. Um, I did singles and doubles, but there were a lot of doubles. These are, these are sisters, but there are a lot of doubles. Um, also outside. Um, and as I did this series, I was so interested in the answers I was getting to my questions that I continued to ask them. Um, um, so like for an example, some of, the, some of the answers were, like for instance, Summer, that the mother and daughter that I showed you back there, she, one, of her ans her, one, of her, one of the things she said was, um, I it, it, the answers were all very poignant and, and really kind of, not similar, but everybody wanted to be loved. Everybody wanted to be accepted. Everybody wanted to, f to feel useful. Everybody wanted to do something that they would maybe be kind of, I mean, not everybody, but these were the answers I was finding all over. So one of the answers that that, that mom said was, I wish to leave, what I wish is that I could leave behind me um, something like, like even two or three great poems, truly great poems. Like she wanted to leave something, you know, memorable. Um, another answer from this series was, um, you know, I hope to be someone who does something good in this world. I don't want to be someone who just takes up space, but I really want to be someone who, who, who will leave something good behind. Something, I mean, that's, a, that's not a, a, an exact quote, but it's something like that. Um, so moving into something a little bit different, the work I'm showing you is chronological. You know, so this was about, I think, 2013, maybe something like that. Um, when there's nobody around and the light is beautiful and I really want to shoot, what I do is I take my fabrics that I shoot people in front of and I take the backdrop poles um, and I, I load them onto my this little tractor I have. It's like a gator. I put my big rubber boots on and I drive out in my cameras and I drive out into our fields and I look for a place to photograph, mostly because I'm just like I really, really want to shoot. And um, I, I basically shoot the fabrics. And what it was really fascinating is how they became subjects for me. Um, so just, I ended up calling these ghost portraits because they're for my father. Um, so a little bit of background on that. We moved from New York City, uh, you know, a number of years ago, we moved from New York City to this farm in Kutztown, Pennsylvania to raise our children like close to the land, through the public school system, you know, like, uh, you know, with nature. And what we did was, and we ended up moving very close to my parents. And um, this farm we lived on, generally out in Pennsylvania, I mean, maybe everywhere in the States, I don't know, but they, they kind of raise the fields. You know, they get rid of all the trees. And what we did was we reforested this property. 
Um, we left it in partial land. I mean, well, st it's still being farmed, but it's partially farmed and partially forested. And so every year, my father, my husband, and my two toddlers, when they were babies, the two older ones, went out every fall and we planted a thousand seedlings. Um, and we like literally reforested the 70 acre property. And for me, the hope was that by the time my children had reached high school, like it would be beautiful and they would, um, they would be proud, you know, they'd bring their friends and it would be gorgeous. And it is, I mean, it is, it's, it's beautiful. There is, it is reforested, but my father didn't make it, as I mentioned before, he didn't make it. And so I call these ghost portraits um, and they're very much about my time with my dad and sort of the spiritual connection he gave us. He gave our whole family, you know, to kind of like about the way, you know, just kind of like learning to work with him on this farm. My dad came from a farm in Greece when he moved here and so it was in his, in his background. Um, so they're ghost portraits. Um, I think what's kind of interesting about them is how they end up connecting with my other portraits in the sense that they have this presence absence thing going on that all of my work tends to have. Um, but they're also kind of ghostly at the same time. And I named them things like October Gold or January Gold or whatever. Those are like all the titles. Oh, this is an installation view of this work. I'm not framing this. I, was, I had put this up, uh, I had a show of this that I put them up with magnets. And so the, the prints are done like this really thick kind of almost like a watercolor paper and they just hung like fabrics. And in this particular space, they actually almost felt like ghosts rising. Like they, they, it, was, it was like the perfect space for them. So what I've realized now also is that I have two kinds of projects. I have my outside projects and I have my inside projects. And my outside projects tend to be, I, I, what I'm doing is photographing mostly groups. And in my studio projects, which would be this one, which is inside, this one and the Falling from Grace uh, work with the fr foods, what I realize is that it's all about relationships, it's all about connections. But when I'm photographing the outside shoots, what I'm photographing is I'm watching people and I'm watching how they interact. But when I come into the studio, what I'm doing is I'm literally watching my interaction with the model. So there, there's this intimacy that's going on and they're literally about why I'm shooting. They're literally about my intentions. And as an artist and as an artist who makes work with a camera and as an artist who makes work with a camera and makes portraits, I think it's, I've figured this out. <laughs> that it's all about connections, it's all about connecting, it's all about being close, it's about longing to be close. And that's like simply and mostly what this project is about. So what I did in this image then is, is I, I pared everything down, I've been sort of paring things down. And so in, in the inside portraits, I mean, they're sort of against a black background. In the, in the food ones, you know, of course, they had the food which had this kind of striking color. But I took all of that away in this project and basically I asked these women. This is a project that's all women and it's all women wearing black and like really plain black. I asked them to not wear any jewelry and as little makeup as they were comfortable with and um, I just looked at them and it was all about staring. and It was all about looking at each other and seeing what would happen. And so ultimately it's really about longing, you know, longing to be close. But I think what gets complicated is that while I find myself photographing and wanting to be close, what I actually f capture is a sense of boundaries. You know, there's like these boundaries, it's almost like boundaries and, and like approachability, like all of that is kind of caught up in these images completely unconsciously. I mean, I didn't plan it, I didn't mean it. Um, this series is also very much taken from these old paintings. It's meant to be seen in a way altogether. In I think all of my series are kind of meant to be seen as a series, but this one particularly, sort of like the Falling from Grey series, it, it's an experience, and it's this experience, this kind of emotional experience. I think if you see them all at once, especially big, I mean, they're, the prints, when they're large, they're kind of intense. 
I think one of the other things I tend to capture in almost all my portraiture is a sense of, um, it's always almost like they're always kind of caught between, you know, what is expected of us and who we want to be. It seems like there's this sense of tension that's always there, this kind of push-pull about wanting to kind of go and something kind of holding us back. Um, this combination of like intensity and restraint. I, I feel like if you look at my portraits closely, it's, it's actually visible in all of them. Uh, a project I'm doing right now, I'm calling this one Holding On. Um, and what it's, uh, I, uh, it's sort of about what we hold on to, who we hold on to. Our hopes, our fears, our past, our future, our whatever. So I invite people to bring someone they are holding on to, and I ask them to, to hold on. Uh, so f these are two very best girlfriends from childhood. These are twin sisters. These are two very good friends. <laughs> Three roommates. Again, everybody I know on some capacity. So th this one on the left was my student, and she brought her her best girlfriends. Uh, these are roommates. Brother and sister. Mother and daughter. Boyfriend and girlfriend. Mother and daughters. Mother and daughter. And when she saw this, she's like, oh my gosh, this is so much is me and my daughter and my daughter pulling away from me and me trying to hold on. <laughs> Mother and daughter. Three sisters. Um, and when, this is a mother and daughter, uh, two daughters, sorry. two sisters. So when they leave, um, I, I, I was really fascinated by this question thing, so I made up another question. I asked them, what does love feel like to you? Not what do you think it should be, not the pretty answer, but what does it really feel like? I'm getting less answers on this one. People are a little less willing to answer this one. <laughs> and I'm going to leave you with a project that is just percolating in my brain. I'm not sure where it's going, but I believe at this point that it's about childhood dreams and expectations. Um, so, as I photograph, I try to put as little distance as possible between the model and myself. I stare, as Walker Evans so aptly wrote, out of curiosity to see what I can see. I look for that most human of places where the model and I are both vulnerable, where our fears and secrets overlap, and our strengths as well. The process is intimate, intense, and very present, and incredibly satisfying. For a few moments, we understand each other perfectly. And in the end, I have the photograph, a record of our connection. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few minutes for some uh Q&A, questions and answers. I'm going to ask you to speak into the microphone. It does not project your voice, but it's for the uh, videos that we edit and then put out on YouTube, Vimeo, and iTunes U. Hi. Uh, thank you. It was a very good lecture. Um, I was really interested that you spoke a lot about the titles of your work. Um, and uh, can you talk a little bit about that, how you decide what your title is going to be and, and why you go in that direction? <laughs> That's a hard question. I'm, I'm, I'm hard with titles. Titles are really hard for me. Um, 
they're very much about how I feel. They may not, like the Mark of Abel, nobody ever knows why I call it that. They're always asking me. Um, I think I explained that one. I don't know if you want me to explain that one again, but that one was more about complicated family relationships. The, the whole notion of titles for me is very much about what I'm feeling while I'm doing that. And so Falling from Grace, for instance, the, the, the series with the food, it's, it's really very personal. Falling from Grace for me is very much about kind of what I said later, what is expected of us and how we get to that place. So Falling from Grace is really about lose, like leaving those expectations, leaving everybody else's expectations behind and finding your own grace really by doing your own thing. And if you didn't put a title on a work, what would that mean? Or is every work titled? Um, I, I title them mostly because they need to be categorized. So when people ask me for like, you know, like I need to see this work, it has to have a title and numbers get really complicated. Like the ghost portraits, th it's very complicated. I call them October gold. And then I photograph the next October and I do another gold piece and it's like, okay, October gold too. It, it, it's <laughs> like, it, it gets very hard. Um, but mostly the, t I, I would prefer not to title them myself, but and my titles are getting more and more bland as I go. <laughs> Okay. And I have a technical question. I noticed that in a number of the portraits, especially the earlier ones and the ghost ones, that the center of the photograph is very sharp and clear and then it gets very fuzzy all around. Could you describe that? How I do it? Yeah, and why It's you do just it? a four by five camera, so you and know, it has a bellows. Does it naturally? Well, I mean, it's it, not naturally. You can make it happen or not make it happen, but you know, it's, if a four by five camera is like a box camera, and it has like, the, the film is back here, the lens is in here, and in between there's a bellows. And you can, it basically you can move the planes of that, you can move the back this way, and this way, and this way, and this way, and you can do the same thing with the front. It can move this way, and this way, and this way, and this way. Every time I change those things, I can make, I can like make my picture blur at any moment, like I mean at any particular spot. So in the ghost portraits, for instance, those, um, like I'm actually focusing on, especially if you see them like live, on very, very tiny areas, and, and, I'm, and a lot of them and the rest of them are kind of out. But it, it's just a technical thing you can do with 4x5, which is one of the reasons I like 4x5 so much. Oh, and one last question as I give up the mic. <laughs> um, and that is, I noticed that also in a lot of the portraits, uh, people, it's not centered, sometimes you see like half of the person out of the frame, or arm or leg or head chopped off. Is that deliberate or you're just capturing a moment or how does that work for you? Um, if you've never used, a, in the four by five especially, I think that happens more. Four by five camera, when you're looking at, it's the kind of camera, you know, you put like a black hood over your head, you're literally looking at your image upside down and backwards. Like that's what I'm seeing. I think when you've got a group of people in front of you and you're looking upside down and backwards, um, Partially, I'm, I'm so focused on their expressions that sometimes I just don't see it. <laughs> um, but that's not the, a really good answer. Um, I think unconsciously on some level I must see it because it's a very specific so style. But I'm seeing it as a design. You know, I'm not seeing it as like, I'm seeing it as a composition really. And I think that that's how it ends up happening. Uh, how long do you stare before you start taking a picture? Because uh, when I put people in front of my camera, they smile. And to get them to be themselves and get the, that expression, if I stare at them for 15 minutes, would that happen? No, I got a technique. I'll fill you in. Um, remember the little girl in the very beginning, that little blonde girl with like little hands sticking out? It was a black and white photograph. Well, I'll tell you the way that happened. Um, my daughter, who is now sitting in the back, who's a grown-up, was like this high. And I used to drive them home from elementary school. And I used to drive this little girl home because her mom worked. And I used to bring her home so she could then pick her up from there. And um, every time we'd be in the car, I'd say, Stephanie, you know, I really want to photograph you. And she'd be like, OK. And then my daughter would go, no, 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 don't let her. It's really boring. Don't let her do that. Finally, one day, she said, she's like, she defied my daughter. And she's like, no, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Only I didn't like love what she was wearing that day. That's how this, that one photograph came out. I'll, I'll go back to it. So I put this plastic thing over her because I wanted to kind of obscure this. So she stood in front of me, in front of the camera. And she went like this. 
And I'm like, oh, Steph. <laughs> I said, you know what, we don't smile for my pictures. <laughs> and she goes like this, <laughs> which is actually when I, that's the expression on the face. Well, when this girl went like this, my daughter, who's sitting there, she goes, oh my God, you never say that's perfect. No, I said, Steph, that's perfect. And my daughter goes, well, you never say that's perfect to me. <laughs> so to defy me, she got up on this chair that, 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 that I had this fabric hang over, and she stuck her hands in it. At that point, I said to my daughter, you know, Anna, that's perfect. Um, that's a little bit of a joke that did happen. But what I do now, this is the other trick I do, the, the grown-up trick. Um, <laughs> When, when I invite someone to photograph them, and they say, yeah, yeah, this, I'm like, you know what, go to my website. Before you say yes, go to my website and just check it out. So by the time they come to me, they say it. They're like, so you don't want me to smile, right? <laughs> and I'm like, mm, not really. So I never have to say it. So how long are you staying at um, I, I don't stare for, I mean, I'm photographing. I waste a lot of film. I, I know it's expensive, but it, it, I, I get them comfortable, so it's, it's, I make them comfortable, so I, it's literally, I mean, I'm staring through my camera. It's cheaper with digital, too. <laughs> yeah, I don't do digital. I don't do digital. It's a whole different ball game. I don't, I don't do digital. For me, the, it, part of what happens is, is that I am fil shooting film. It's part of the process that I don't know what's happening. I, it's, it's, I just did a project, and I've got a thing right now going, this public art project where I shot digitally, like a whole different process. <laughs> film is slower. I'm using bigger cameras. Um, it's slower. I have a limited amount of film. So I have to, like, my whole head is, like, intensely thinking about this image. Um, it, it's like a different process completely. Yeah, no, digital is cheaper, but... But I get what I get of because of before film. Before you start getting serious, so. I, I take a few. <laughs> Thank you. I like your stuff. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was wondering about the the film digital thing because at some point you, when you're printing, you're scanning, and you're editing, how much time do you have between like the shoot and when you do it? In, is it is it weeks? Is it months? And the scans, you mean? Yeah, when you make a decision, you shot, and now you're going to like edit and print. How much time do you allow yourself? Um, it varies. If I'm shooting a lot, it can take months. Mm -hmm. If I'm kind of like on a slow period, it can be like the next week. All of a sudden, I'm going, oh, oh my gosh, I know exactly which one I want. It, it kind of varies. Um, the ones, the holding on ones, I've actually was, I started making them in triptychs. I'm kind of changing my mind about it. That's really hard. That takes me months and months because I have to literally pick three images that are both, all three good and then all three work together in a certain order. And that, and, and I, you know, I do my like little scans on my little scanner, but then I end up sending them out for like drum scans. So that can take months. The decision is, it's hard. I find it, it I find it hard. You know, narrowing it down to something, it's, it's it is hard. <laughs> um, so you said that when you photograph people, you often are looking to form a connection. So when you choose, when you're at the end of the process and you're choosing what photos you know you want to print, are they often the ones where you did form a connection with the subject or didn't? Which are more interesting? Oh yeah, you know what? The connection is actually a like when I'm photographing, I, I literally fall in love with my models. That's the connection. I feel like I know them. When I, you know, when you look at someone through a camera, it's so different from like talking to someone in real life because you're like allowed to stare. So the the, the connection for me, it's like a personal connection. It happens in that like hour that we're shooting. I I'm like exhilarated. I feel like I've had this amazing experience. I'm exhausted. Um, the images themselves. That comes from the editing. Um, I don't think any more about connections. At that point, I think I'm just thinking, wow, this picture, like, I just want to keep looking at this picture, like, for some reason. And I think, really, that sometimes I pick the ones where the connection's really nebulous. It's like, I think it's like almost a, 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 like a, it's like I, I think I photograph to make connections, but I print to show the messiness of connections. I, I, something like that. Cool. Thank you. I mean, I, you know, I do this stuff so unconsciously, and it kind of, um, it, it shows me what's going on. You know, I don't tell it what's happening. It, it really tells me. I think that really came out in your work, that you allow the process and the time 
to sort of teach you and enlighten you too, which I, I, I love that vulnerability. And many times we don't give ourselves the time or the openness to do that. Yeah, and I think that's what makes it scary in a way. You know, it, it makes every time I have a shoot, I'm like, oh God, what if I don't see something? You know, what if it doesn't work? But ultimately it's, it's the exciting part of it and what makes me, I think, keep doing it. Well, I'd like to thank you. I think we're all inspired. And Thanks so much. Appreciate it very much. <laughs>